Ready to dive into the Word of Life this morning? Well, in Joshua chapter 24, verse 15, there's a verse of Scripture that we've been reading each week. It says, If it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, then choose this day whom you will serve. Are you going to serve the God your father served in that region beyond the river? Or are you going to serve the God of the Amorites in the land that you now dwell? But as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. You have to pick a side. There, isn't no, there is no gray option. You're either going to choose to be with God or you're going to choose to be against God. But it's a choice that every single one of us are going to make. A couple of months ago, God blessed me with a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I got a phone call um, in June asking me if I would like to go with a group of pastors from the Gateway Church Network to Alaska to go on a fishing tour. And I said, yeah, I would love that, but I don't have Alaska fishing tour money. And so they said, you know what? All you have to do is pay for your airfare and we'll cover everything else. And so I talked to my wife about it. She really encouraged me to go. And so she really did. She, Amy's always a blessing with that. I fought her because I'm just, I'm cheap. Let's just be honest, right? And so made the decision to go, got to go to Alaska. And uh, it was an amazing experience. My first day out on the water, though, I got to tell you, I broke the record for this particular fishing trip. I threw up more times... <laughs> than any other person has ever thrown up on this trip, 25 times in four hours. Yeah, they nicknamed me Chum. I mean, it was, it was a bad, bad experience. So the next day, I, uh, I took their advice, and I got one of those little patches, and um, they said, don't go tomorrow, stay at home, and then go the third day. So I said, okay, that's fine. So I'm like, okay, God, I'm in Alaska. I'm not going to sit in a lodge while all these guys are out having fun. What do I do? And so I, went, I was going out for a walk every morning and every afternoon, and I'm walking one day, and I see this mountain. Sean, would you put that picture up there? And uh, see that mountain in the background? I want to climb that. I've never climbed a mountain. I'm alone in Alaska. That sounds like a good idea. My wife didn't think it was a good idea, but you know what? Come on, God's with me. So uh, I set about climbing this mountain. It, it wasn't a huge mountain. It's a little less than 5,000 feet, but from base to the top, all by myself in the middle of Alaska. And, uh, but I did have great cell service, just so that you know. So I kept in contact during that, just so if I had to be airlifted out of there, I had an option. So uh, I started climbing the mountain. The first thing I ran across was this amazing waterfall. So I'm, just to kind of walk, walk through this with me. So this waterfall cascading down the mountain, this waterfall was like 500 feet this picture doesn't do it justice. I kept walking a little bit further and I found this mountain stream that this path hugged all along the way. Now, one of the interesting things about this mountain path was that I thought I was just going to go up the mountain. No, it was a 12 mile round trip. So to go one mile up, I had to walk six miles to get up one mile. So this was, it was a lot of walking that day. Go to the next one. So I get up to the top of the tree line, about 3,000 feet, and I start taking pictures. Because if you've ever climbed a mountain, as you get up the mountain, it looks a lot different than it did at the bottom. Because our perspective from the bottom of the mountain is never the same as it is along the journey to the top. I got a little bit further up, and I caught this next picture. This is seaward Alaska while the tide is out. But I'm about 3,500 feet now up from up from the base, and I'm able to see just beautiful things, and this is still, I'm at the cloud level, I'm below the clouds. Go to the next picture. This was the next part. You see that path right there? That was leading to the summit. The summit of this particular mountain is still there in front of me. Now, when I started, I thought where I was at this point was the top of the mountain, I got above the tree line and I realized, no, there's a whole other mountain on top of where I'm at. And I really thought about being like, ah, I could fake it, right? Nobody's going to know, but keep going. So this is the valley that I had to walk up to get to the summit of the mountain. I mean, just, just beautiful. And by the way, there's nobody. Like, I didn't see another person that entire day. 
The only thing that I did see when I got to the top of the mountain was a bear. Why at the top? Why are you at the top of the mountain? I have no idea. He was lost, just as lost as I was. Next picture. That's the, what the last thousand feet up the mountain look like. Just loose shale rock. Now, I've got to tell you, when you get to that level, when you get to that place, you stay on the path. Because there's no other option than staying on the path. Next shot. I just thought that looked like something out of Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Just up here on this mountain, this beautiful lake. I was just like, I could jump in that. And I was like, no, not going to do it. Next picture. And this is the view from the top. This is a panoramic shot of all the mountains and, and seaward down below me. And you can see how high I am, how high I am up above the clouds at this point. Now, the reason that I, I walked you through that, just number one, I wanted to brag that I climbed a mountain. Um, number two, there's this misperception in the world that all paths lead up the mountain. And this is an expression that people use to mean that no matter what religion you're a part of, as long as you're going up the mountain, you're going to arrive at the same destination. Let me tell you something. It's not true. Now, every religion is going to contain a certain amount of truth, right? So in Buddhism, you're going to learn about something called the Eightfold Way. And if you don't know better, it, it really sounds a lot like Christianity because it teaches good things like patience and contentment. Those are, those are true things. Um, in Judaism, you're going to learn a lot about God, except they stop short of Jesus, so you're still not getting all the way up the mountain. In Islam, you're going to learn some true things. You're going to learn about that there is only one God. But again, you're still not going to get all the way up the mountain. You see, all of the paths, all of the religions in the world, they do have a little bit of truth. So they do go a little way up the mountain. The problem with all of the world's religions is that they don't go all the way to the top. They either take you into a, a really dangerous dead end or they just stop short of truth and they don't go all the way. That last thousand feet, that last two thousand feet up the mountain, there's only one path up that bad boy and that's Jesus. So this morning, we're going to talk about picking a side between relationship and religion. In 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, it says, Now David again gathered all of the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and he went with all of the people who were with him from Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned on the cherubim. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God, and Ahio went before the ark. A lot of time religion starts out from a, good, from a place of good intentions. But religion does not take God fully into consideration. Because religion is man's effort to earn God's favor. So instead of just asking God, what do you want? How can I know you for who you are? Religion says, nah, I'm going to figure this out on my own. Have you ever gotten a birthday present or a Christmas present? And you gave somebody like a list of what you wanted? And then they just went rogue on you? And what you got looked exactly nothing like what you wanted for a birthday or Christmas. That's what religion does. Because God's saying, I have spelled out for you what relationship with me looks like. I've given you a book. There is a manual for this. But yet in your desire to do it on your own... You go off and you just get me whatever you feel like getting me because you think you know better. That's not what God wants. So King David, he got him a new cart. 
He spared no expense. He gave the best that he had to offer. The problem was God had already told him how to carry the ark. And you don't do that on a cart. In Exodus chapter 25, 13, it says, You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And you shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark by them. You see, God wanted the ark carried upon the shoulders of the priests because God deserves to be lifted up and worshipped, not just pushed along in front of us. In John chapter 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, if you know me, you're going to keep my commandments. Don't do this on your own. Don't try to figure this out by yourself. Just do the things that I have told you to do because I love you. And if you truly love me, this is going to work out great. But when you go off into religion, trying to make it happen on your own, you're going to fall short every time. When our worship or our pursuit of God is about us, that's religion. But when our worship and our pursuit of God is about Him, that is relationship. This is really true of any interaction that we have with a person. Any relationship that's going to have any value, any strength, any longevity, we're going to seek to know that person for who they are, not for who we want them to be. We're not going to pursue somebody because we think they could be something. No, we're going to seek to know them on their own terms. God wants the same thing. 2 Kings 6, 5. So David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord. They they were singing songs. They were playing lyres and harps, tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon... Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. Everything sounds good up to this point, right? We got a new cart, right? Like, we brought in the nice cart, the really nice one. Kind of like when you go to the funeral home and they've got, like, the really nice Cadillac that takes you around. Yeah, they bring out the best because it's a moment of importance. So David brings out his best. He just brings out his best instead of God's. And something happens. You see, there's a reason why you don't want it on the cart. Because if the oxen stumbles, the ark falls off. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. And God struck him down there because of his error. And he died there beside the ark of God. David was angry. Because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah. And that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David. But David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Guys, so many times in our use of religion, we fall short of God's standards. And things don't go the way that we want them to. And then who do we blame? We get mad at God. Well, God, why didn't you protect me? God, why aren't you blessing me? God, why won't you make this relationship work even though I'm doing it completely different than the way you've asked me to? God, why won't you provide for my bills even though I show up late four days out of five days of the week? God, why won't you allow me to have better relationships even though I walk around angry all the time and I'm judgmental and I, and I like to gossip? Why, why can't I have friends, God? We get angry at the Lord because the Lord has shown us a way and we've gone off on our own path. Fear, which is awe or reverence, draws us nearer to God. But being afraid of God drives us away. Religion teaches you to be afraid of God because God's not personal and you don't know if he loves you. But when you draw near to God through love, you begin to fear him with reverence and awe and respect because you understand how great and mighty and awesome he is. But you also understand and know that all of his intentions towards you are good all the time. So you're not going to run away from God. You're going to run to him when things become difficult. 
In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many works in your name? Guys, I think that this is the most sobering passage of Scripture in the Bible. Because it sounds like these people have it all going on for them. They're casting out demons. They're prophesying. If you walked into a church, you would probably think they were the most spiritual person in there. And Jesus says, yet these people will not go to heaven. What? It's because they were operating from a place of religion and not relationship. They understood the words to say, but they didn't understand the person that they were saying them about. Jesus says, yeah, you did a lot of things. And you did them in my name, but you did them for your benefit. You weren't doing this stuff for me. You were doing this stuff for you. Because you wanted people to think that you were religious. You used my name to get the result that you wanted. That's not relationship. In Hebrews 11.6 it says, and without faith, what's our definition of faith? Absolute trust in the goodness of God. That is faith melted down to its basic level. Faith is absolute trust in the goodness of God. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. If you've ever been in a in a relationship before you know how good it feels for somebody to want to get to know you not to get to know somebody else but to get to know you to have somebody fall in love with you your personality your gifts your quirks your traits the things that make you uniquely you maybe even the things that annoy other people about you they find endearing they find sweet they find cute because that person loves you for you this is what god wants from us too guys how many of us really believe that god exists now i want to challenge that Do you believe that God exists as he reveals himself? Or do you believe in your own version of God? Because this is where a lot of people get confused and angry about God. I was having a conversation with a young man not too long ago. And he came and he said, Pastor Tanner, I've been doing this, 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 and this. And bad things still keep happening to me. Bad things shouldn't be happening to me because God should do this, 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 and this. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. The problem that you're experiencing is not that you don't have faith. You just have faith in the wrong God. Because the God that you're talking about doesn't actually exist. You are coming at God from a place of religion. You're trying to make God in your own image. You're trying to make God something that you want him to be, not who he has said that he is. So you're going to be confused and frustrated and angry about this God that you've made up because your God's going to fail you because he's not real. Let me give you an example. Job. Job's attitude at the beginning of the book was, I have been righteous... I have made a big effort, so you owe me happiness. That was Job's attitude. But after about 40 chapters of his friends trying to encourage him, God told him that it was his goodness, that it had nothing to do with Job's goodness or effort. God blesses us because he is good. We live in a fallen and broken world, and yet God still breaks through in goodness because he loves us, not because we've earned it. That's religion. 
So if your attitude is, I'm going to hold back from God until he gives me everything that I want, good luck. Because that's not approaching God on his terms. That's not seeking to know God for who he is. We serve a benevolent, loving, kind, merciful, gracious, generous, amazing God. But we also live in a broke world. And if you can't reconcile that those two things can exist simultaneously, you're stuck in religion. And you're demanding that God jump through your hoops instead of you come to him where he is at. Romans 8, 28. For we know that those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. Guys, if I've said this once, I've said it a thousand times from this stage. This does not promise that God will make all things good. It promises that God is big enough and strong enough and power enough powerful enough to even bring good out of the mess because he loves us the flourishing life the good life that God intends for us is the promise that God is so great that he can still bring goodness even from the midst of pain and suffering and we recoil at this, and then the, thing, the next thing that the philosophers want to say, again, operating from a place of religion, instead of taking the time to actually get to know God, is they'll say, well, if God is good, he would not allow evil to exist. Or he would not have created evil. Well, let me explain something. He didn't! You read the first chapter of Genesis, and you're going to read one word eight times. You know what the word is? G-O-O-D. It's good. And God saw that it is good. And God saw that it was good. And God saw that it was good when he made man. And God saw that it was very good. Because man was made in God's image, so it was even better than the rest. But it was all good. God created it perfect, and he handed it over to us, and we broke it. It's like giving a six-year-old a remote control car on Christmas. You spent $387 on that thing, and it was completely destroyed in 4.6 seconds. Because they thought it was a good idea to drive it out in the street in front of an oncoming car. It's what happened with creation. God said, look at this beautiful gift that I'm giving you for you to rule and you to reign. And we were like... Thanks, God. What else you got for me? That's religion. I'm going to step all over what you've given me and I'm going to demand more. God says, no, 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 no. You broke it. But I'm going to fix it. And I'm going to fix it myself, my way. 1 John 3, 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us? That we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Guys, this is the problem. Big Al certified right there. <laughs> Thank you, man. The world does not know God because it's operating from the place of religion. Religion has created all kinds of depictions of God in man's image. But God demands that he be known as he is on his terms. You ever tried to change somebody? How'd that work out for you? <laughs> God is good. We must embrace his goodness, not seek our own definition. Human beings change. God is immutable. It's a big word that means unchanging. But we want God to be unchanging because his unchanging is good. We want to change because we go from broken and messed up and bad to healed and holy and good through Jesus. In Titus chapter 3 verse 5 it says, He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and by the renewal of the Holy Spirit. 
Again, you didn't get saved because of anything you did. You got saved because God was merciful to you. Our, our worship and our effort should come as a result of God's mercy and a recognition of his goodness. We respond, we do not initiate the work of the Holy Spirit. We do not demand that he responds to our work. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, it says, You need to beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Let me give you the 2022 version. Don't be taking selfies. <laughs> Truly I say to you, they have already received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. This does not say you can't do good deeds in front of other people, okay? It's talking about the motivation behind it. Are you doing good deeds from a place of relationship because you want people to experience the Jesus that you have? Or are you doing it from a place of religion where you want people to think that you're something? The reward that God wants to give us is relationship with himself. Doing something that you know pleases God because you love God. Or do you simply want to be known by the world? That's your option. Do you want to be known by God? Or do you want to be known by people? Religion versus relationship. In Luke chapter 18, he gives us a pretty powerful story. He told this parable to those who trusted in themselves. Another word or phrase for religion. That they were righteous. And they treated others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other was a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing off by himself, prayed this way. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. Those extortioners, the unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. You're welcome. I give tithes of 